Hi friends, it's Chrissy, and this is another episode of Artist Confessional. Today, Kyle and I are gonna walk you through the reinvention of one of our old installations. This doesn't happen to us very often, but we are so lucky to have been invited to install the butterflies that we made in 2022 in a new installation. And we want to show you how we went about doing that and just talk to you a bit about how nice it is when you get to take something that you've done in the past and re-envision it in a new space. What are the secrets of studio practice? It's Chrissy. I'm out in the print shop. I thought maybe you would want to see how we custom make all of our ink. I will be working with screen printing base and screen printing pigment from TriArt. That's what they look like. So this is a clear base and these are color pigments. So I'll add those in to create the custom colors. TriArt's a company that is from Canada actually located not too far away from us. And they were kind enough to send us the colors and that little base, but we also had a, a larger one here at the shop. So we'll be able to mix the eight colors that I need to whip up for this project. This is our color palette. That's the plan. <laughs> oh, brand new container. So satisfying. It's a lot more clear, not in the jar. Transparent base. I'm just mixing on glass. Sometimes I mix in a cup. We are out of cups. Kyle always mix on, mixes on the glass, just straight on the glass. It kind of is the better way to do it. Now, we have a limited range of colors here and none of them are, well, we have cyan i mean magenta but we don't have any of the other like straight up cyan magenta yellow look how satisfying that is okay something i didn't consider is that the ink that we generally mix is like concentrated pigments so you put like a drop of a color into the base and mix it in it like spreads a really long way but this new stuff says like one to one ratio, which is a, it's kind of a lot. So I'm going to, I'm going to ignore it for now. And then we'll see if I'm going to regret that later because I, I put a lot of base out here and I don't want to use that much of this pigment. Follow me down this road to potential misery. The goal of this color is lime green. This is such a pretty turquoise. I have to work within the color range that I have here, which is this particular yellow and two versions of blue. And I'll have to try to get as close as I can to the green that I'm looking for within the spectrum that these colors can make. Right now, I feel like this green looks a little bit, I don't know, scummier than the brightness that I'm getting here. So I'm gonna put like the tiniest amount of black in just to bring it closer to a, like a sappier green. And then I have to keep adding yellow, I think. So I'm going to do yellow first because it is transparent and my paper is white. So I don't want to put in too much titanium white because it shouldn't be necessary if I'm like thinking about the paper being white. Okay, where are we at now? I just dab it out onto a white paper so I can kind of see the progress as it goes. It looks relatively the same as it did before. So that means keep going. I wish that I could say I had like a really good system for color mixing. It has so much to do with my gut and just feeling out what seems right. But 
generally what I'm trying to make sure when I'm looking at the paper tests is that there's an even consistency and it doesn't look like it's going to turn into like a streaky or splotchy ink. Color one is completed. Took maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes or so? Maybe a little bit longer? Here is the swatch. So we always do a little pull using kind of a grimy screen so that we can have a sample of it. We can write any information we want, what project it was for, etc. And we can also line it up with the printed out version. It's a bit brighter than the printed version, but that's because we printed on low quality and it's just like, you know, an inkjet print or whatever. So it's a little punchier. Matches more what you see on the computer screen than what you see on this paper, but I think it turned out. Should look good. If I was smarter, I would have been a lot more conscious of how much of each color I had put out. Also, how, what the volume of base that I had here. So that if during the course of printing this job that we're doing, if we run out of ink, like if this isn't actually enough, I would be able to really quickly make a new batch. But I, I didn't do that. I didn't really think about that until right now. So the good thing is that I was really paying attention to what colors I was putting in and realizing like I need a lot more black and I need a lot more yellow. So next time I'll be able to hopefully tighten up the time a little bit. I had to make eight different colors. After the lime green, I moved on to the other seven. And overall, I really enjoyed it. The Maprin ink that we had been working with before was lovely in terms of the, I really like the concentrated pigments, but the opaque white that we had was a, I hate to say it, but it was an actual nightmare. It was really unpleasant. It was hard to mix in. It was very streaky. If you wanted it to be a combination of opaque white and transparent base. With the Triart, I haven't had any of that experience. The colors mixed together super well. They were true to what I was seeing in the container. So I had a confidence that was really nice. Yeah, overall, thoroughly enjoyed this experience. I think I have a problem with volume. I'm not very good at spatial awareness. And when I'm mixing the ink, I'm having a hard time keeping down the amount that I need. With the old ink, because we we're just putting in drops of like diluted pigment or pure pigment rather, it meant that the volume sort of stayed the same. But now because I'm like mixing like actual ink with other ink, it just was growing and growing rapidly. <laughs> We're here in the studio. We are reprinting one of our previous projects. This is the third iteration of this project. In 2022, we had the Alvar project. The Alvar project was a collection of 1,000 butterflies that we installed on a 60 foot long length of chain link fence. The project consisted of eight different butterflies that are commonly found in the biodiverse habitat called Alvars which are commonly denoted as these areas along the shores of Ontario that have about six inches of topsoil before it hits limestone. And then in late 2022, we reinstalled the butterflies in a reimagined space as the canopy to a very large cardboard tree as part of the Fire Lantern Festival that year. When we disassembled that installation, Chrissy and I deemed that they were not salvageable for a third time, which is why we're here in the studio. We are remaking this for the Drake Devonshire to install in their front lobby of the hotel. Although we are not doing the 1000 butterflies in the original art installation, we are scaling it back to kind of fit within the client's like budget and what they're looking to fill. And we're going to do about maybe 250 to 300 of these. There might be about 30 to 40 of each of the eight different varieties of butterfly printed. In the original Alvar project, we used a lot of different papers and a lot of them were very quite thin. A few of them were around a cardstock thickness and then a few were also a little bit heavier than that. Predominantly, they were really thin. Looking back at that, 
I'm now going to apply the feedback that the weather told me, which is thin paper doesn't hold up very long in humidity or in rain or out in the sun. So we've kind of increased the thickness of the papers that we've selected for this iteration of printing. Getting to reinstall this means that so much of the technical hurdles are already accomplished. What shape they're going to be, what the imagery is, why that imagery matters, and how we're going to assemble them, or how we're going to build them, or staple them together to have form and body. All that work's done. Now we just get to like refocus on printing, and then get back to kind of like improving upon what our installation was. Something that both of us are really interested in seeing and exploring is not just only the color quality of the tri ink, but also how that ink is applied to and sits and rests on different qualities of paper. Because of the nature of the Alvar project being on so many varieties of paper with varieties of colors, it really gives us a strong opportunity to conduct some research and kind of really test out a product. I heard the printing process went great. Kyle seemed to breeze through it really quickly, which was really nice because I mixed the colors so I didn't do any of the printing and it's always good when I have a good color making mixing experience and Kyle has a good printing experience. Highlights of the printing experience that I heard from Kyle include, the ink stayed loose for a really long time and it seemed to print consistently. Feedback that I got was that because I was being a bit, let's say, shy with the amount of pigment that I was putting in, certain colors like the reds, where I, I probably wasn't doing the 50-50 ratio that was literally suggested on the package, it meant that it was a little bit light and a little bit splotchier than we would have noticed with the pure pigment process. When I say splotchy, I mean that there are some areas that are a bit more transparent and then other areas where the pigment is a bit more intense. So there's not a consistent flat color across the butterfly. Thinking about the splotchiness, I would say that it's definitely, that's on me. I made decisions to not add enough pigment. Something I'm looking forward to when I start printing some of my own pieces with this particular ink is the fact that it stays um, wetter. I don't know the right word. <laughs> Doesn't dry out as fast in the screen. And I think that's gonna be really nice. The other thing I'm really excited about is what I was mentioning before, which is that the white uh, pigment isn't creating like a streakiness and it's not kind of clumping together and rolling down the screen. It all stays a consistent and smooth, uh, nice smooth consistency. I'm excited about that. You might be curious how Kyle and I find opportunities like this. In this particular scenario, it was based on networking and connections. Kyle and I had made the effort when the Drake Devonshire opened to connect with them and find out what, they're, what they were doing. We knew they were really interested in the arts and we had made a connection with Ashley in the past when she was working at the Devonshire. Ashley Mulvihill is the founder and curator of Ninth Editions, which is an online gallery space that supports emerging artists and sells affordable artwork. And they have a sister organization called Studio Ninth, which is an organization that helps the public and private sector bring artwork into their space. So, you know, always like check in and meet people and let them know what you do because you honestly never know when they might have an opportunity that would be a perfect fit. When Ashley reached out to us about putting up the butterflies again in the space, we made sure that we asked a few clarifying questions so that we knew that we were going to be the right fit for the project. Something that we wanted to ensure was that she was okay with us having to reprint everything. We knew that the pieces that we had put up outside were not going to be right for this particular space. We also wanted to make sure that she really understood that we would need to be putting upwards of 600 holes in the walls. And there are some spaces that are really not okay with that. You know, we wanted to make sure that the damage to the walls was gonna be all right, that reprinting the butterflies was gonna be okay and in their budget. You know, we really understood how much space they wanted them to take up, like how much of the room are we going onto the ceiling? Are we going close to the floor? So that we knew that we could actually fulfill the volume and the way they wanted the space to feel. 
when we're working through a project like this, we have to be mindful of a few different things, but one of the main ones is time. So depending on when someone approaches a, us about a project, we have to think about whether or not we can actually fulfill what they're asking in the time frame that they're requesting it. In this particular instance, it was, when are we being asked and <laughs> can we actually accomplish printing, cutting, folding, all of these butterflies within that time frame. And so we plan that out in a calendar. It seems pretty simple, but there have been times in the past where we get excited about a project, we say yes, but then when we think through all of the different steps, it's actually not very accomplishable. If you've been hanging out with Kyle and I for a while, you know that we love Notion and that we're a bit obsessive about recording our hours that we put into projects. It may seem a little ludicrous to some people, but in this particular example, it pays off really well. Because we took like notorious notes about the creation of Instar for the Alvar project in the summer of 2022, we knew pretty much down to the minute how long it took to print them, how long it took us to mix the colors, how long it took us to cut everything, how long it took us to fold everything, and how long it took us to physically put all of the butterflies up. Because we had all of those figures in place, we knew exactly whether or not we could make this project happen in the time frame given. Because it might seem like, oh, you're just printing some pieces of paper and then you're sticking those onto a wall. But actually a lot more goes into that. You know, you ha have to hand mix all of the colors. That takes a long time. You're printing stencils. So you're taking a drawing, you're putting it onto a computer, then you're printing that out onto a piece of acetate. You're shooting every single one of those stencils onto a screen that has been hand coated in emulsion. Then you're physically printing by hand every single one of those, which means you also have to cut all of that paper down to size. Then you're cutting each of those butterflies out by hand. You're folding all of them by hand, and then you're installing all of them by hand. So there's actually a lot of moving parts into something that might just seem like, oh, you took some pictures of butterflies and stuck them onto a wall. Believe it or not, I adore doing this part of the process. There's something so nice about just putting on a podcast or a show and doing a repetitive task over and over again. Maybe this is why we keep adding this type of element into every project that we do. So 300 butterflies is a lot and it might seem more advantageous to set it up with a robot like the Cricut that we have, but it's not 300 of the same butterfly. It's 300 of eight different butterflies. So s scanning and making sure that the cut is going to be right. Oh, it's planning all of that out in Photoshop and then on the Cricut and then putting down the paper and taking it off and putting it down and taking it off. Actually, in the end, I think is more work than just hand cutting it. And part of it is I think that sometimes there's a barrier for me, especially to setting up the systems to do something with a computer and a robot. I'm sure I'm not alone. It's like I can immediately start hand cutting something. Yeah, I can just dive in and get into it and I don't have to do an extra step. With this collection of prints, we decided that scoring them was a really important step. In the past, we've done projects like this one, where we had about 400 birds that were relief printed, and we just left them flat. It worked in this space because they were hanging from the ceiling, but with the butterflies, we wanted to give them dimension. So how can we give them more of a sculptural form without actually turning them into three-dimensional objects? And each of them is folded a little bit different, some of them have staples to give them a little bit more of a body and some of them don't so that they bounce off the wall in a different way. The paper that we're working with is a rag paper, so printmaking paper, which means it has like, it's pretty dense, it's a heavy paper. It also means that you can get a really interesting variety when you're scoring them. So we actually just use like um, quilting, uh, 
quilting rulers. I'm not a quilter. I don't know if they have actual names. And uh, the score tool that we have for our Cricut. And if you score on the top, then when you fold it, everything's going to lift up. But if you flip the paper over and you score the other way, then everything is going to dip down. So you're basically making like zigzag type folding way that Kyle kind of worked with this was he created a few different score patterns so that each of the butterflies has a different way that their wings are being structured and some of them are laying kind of directionally into the wall while others are kind of flying directionally out of the wall. I just, I think that it's really interesting the ways that he's tackled this because it's different than the first version. And that's actually something kind of cool about being able to do a project more than once. I, I wish that this happened to us more often, honestly, because it meant that we got to learn from what we did in the past. The other cool thing about the scoring is when we had them set up at the Devonshire, you can see that the light is hitting them and it's casting really interesting shadows. And it allowed us to pin them in different ways so that they're like kind of pulling away from the wall instead of just laying flat against the wall. I think that the folding adds a lot and even though it is a bit of a labor intensive pro process, it was a really good decision. All right, we're off and we're going to the Drake Devonshire. This install was like so breezy to pack the car. It was like two ladders and a few boxes. It felt like not stressful. The whole This whole project hasn't felt stressful actually. It's been an absolute delight. So we're here at the Drake and Kyle and I have been really lucky to have worked with the Drake a few other times in the past. And it is a hotel and restaurant. We used to put work up in their lobby in these like little glass windows. We built blanket forts on the property once upon a time with crazy dames. We have done storytelling events where we had a group of people come and we shared Canadian adventure stories. We have done workshops at the Drake. It's been a really welcoming space for us. It's really nice to be back and be putting something new into, into the lobby space. Maybe some of you have never been to the Drake Devonshire. Something that we really love about it is that there's art all over the place. Like literally everywhere there's art. And when we go, we often get to see work by artists that we know and are friends with. And some of them are past residents. When I was working with the composition in the space, we had decided we wanted all the butterflies to be flying towards the front desk area. And so as I was working through, I was constantly kind of coming back and trying to make sure that they were concentrated enough, but not so clumped together that there wasn't any movement happening. It also, we were working with multiple different dimensions. So, you know, one wall is at the back, then we have this fireplace coming out and there's a um, bulkhead that's coming out over top of where the fireplace is. So. You know, as I'm going through, I want to have some of them like flying in this direction and some of them flying in this direction and just making sure that they aren't all facing the same way because then it becomes really stagnant. Just trying to like mix them up and have some of them really tight together and some of them sort of going off so that it creates something that feels like there's motion and energy. We're so happy to see these butterflies up again and installed in a new way. Having the chance to recreate this project and just expand on it and, you know, play with the parts that we would have loved to have done a little bit differently in the first two iterations is, is just a blessing. We're just, so we're just so happy to have had the chance to do that. And we're really grateful for you sticking around and watching us uh, transform this lounge into a butterfly sanctuary you know, subscribe, like, all the things that you normally do on YouTube. And if you want to see more of what we're doing behind the scenes, consider joining our Patreon community. There's a link in the description below. Until next time, we hope that you have a lovely, arty life. <laughs>